Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on finance, constitution and economy. Question number one, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its ministers helped promote small businesses, but small business Saturday in what position it is on supporting such events in the future. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government recognises the vital role small businesses play in our economy and we are committed to helping them to thrive. Initiatives like Small Business Saturday help raise the profile of small businesses. My ministerial colleagues and I supported the campaign working with the Federation of Small Businesses. We visited a wide variety of small local businesses on the day and made good use of social media to encourage communities to do the same. We want to ensure that people continue to support their local small businesses throughout the year. Can I, th Richard Lyon. Can I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for that uh, reply. Can I refer members to my Register of Interest? I am the convener of the Cross Party Group for Showmen. What further help can the Minister give to small businesses who may not have fixed premises and may not be helped, uh, receive help through the small business bonus, in particular showmen who face reduced income due to the present regulations in the 1982 Licence in Scotland Act, especially as uh, they celebrate their 125th year? Cabinet Secretary. I, I think if I, uh, there are a number of ways in which um, people who do not occupy um, uh, continuous business premises are provided with opportunities to contribute to local economies. I can think of some of the um, temporary markets, for example, that exist around about this time of year in um, uh, different communities. There is one in the city that I represent, the city of Perth. Um, and uh, these all uh, are opportunities facilitated by local authorities to enable uh, businesses of this type to participate. I think what's important is to recognise that throughout the year, the small business community provides a valuable contribution to the strength and the confidence of the local economy. As a consequence, it was a, a pleasure to support uh, Small Business Saturday. But I think of more importance is the ongoing support that the government offers through the Small Business Bonus Scheme, which now supports 92,000 businesses around the country, is a particularly good example of how the government, year, day in, day out, can provide assistance to the small business community of Scotland. Thank you. Question number two, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what planning it is doing to keep the jobs and opportunities of decommissioning the oil and gas industry in Scotland. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has conducted extensive and detailed planning to help create a decommissioning industry in Scotland to take advantage of a sector estimated by Oil and Gas UK to be worth a, a total of £37 billion between now and 2040. This planning work has included <coughs> establishment of DECOM North Sea, publication of our Scottish Government oil and gas strategy in 2012, promotion of energy skills with a budget of £6.5 million, career promotion through My World of Work and other initiatives, consideration of the essential elements of decommissioning by the Independent Fiscal Commission report in July, and publication uh, in October of uh, a detailed report by Scottish Enterprise on decommissioning capacity. Thank you. Jenny Mara. I thank the uh, Minister for his response. I am concerned, though, Presiding Officer, that much um, work of decommissioning seems to be going to Norway, to Holland and to the Midlands of England, like Hartlepool, and there doesn't seem to be a substantial amount of decommissioning work being kept in Scotland at the moment. As he said, the industry is worth billions of pounds over the next couple of generations, and the oil and gas industry um, feel, I think, that the more needs to be done to keep these jobs in Scotland. Can he step this programme up and identify areas in Scotland where he feels decommissioning should be taking place? Minister. Uh, well, I can do more than that. I can say that we were investing in decommissioning as well as planning, which was what the original question asked. We've invested very substantially in decommissioning, uh, and uh, especially in the island of Shetland. Uh, and, of course, this is being taken forward by the industry. And I myself have... Uh, uh, had involvement in this with uh, CNR meeting their project manager in respect of the Murchison field, which is being uh, decommissioned, uh, and in a, a large number of other areas. So it's up to the industry to take forward the decommissioning work. We are working extremely closely with Oil & Gas UK and with several operators with whom I met regularly, most recently on Monday of this week. Mike McKenzie. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I wonder if the Minister could just tell us a bit more about 
what assistance the Scottish Government has provided in terms of improving the decommissioning facilities in Shetland and allowing Shetland to capture this valuable economic opportunity? Minister. Uh, well, well, yes, I have been working over the past three years to ensure that the opportunities at Shetland for decommissioning are pursued. And of course, as the member knows from his campaigning on this particular area in Shetland regularly, uh, Shetland is geographically best placed to be a hub for decommissioning work. That's why I have met on several occasions with Sandra Lawrenson, Lawrenson of the Lewick Port Authority, with Murdo McKeever and his colleagues at Peterson SBS, and that's why that work has led and come to fruition over the last three years, presiding officer, to substantial investment of around 1.2 million, levering 20 million pounds of private sector investment in Lerwick. We are still waiting for commensurate contributions from the UK government. Uh, question number three, David Torrance, has been withdrawn for understandable reasons. So I now call question number four, Mark Macdonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government to what extent small businesses in Aberdeen have benefited from the Small Business Bonus Scheme. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, in Aberdeen City, an estimated 2,045 businesses pay zero or reduced rates under the Small Business Bonus Scheme and have saved around £25.4 million in business rates taxation through the scheme since, since its introduction in 2008. Thank you. Mark Macdonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Small Business Saturday, I visited the Bynum Bakery in my constituency. The owners, Ali and Fiona Rate, took over the business in 2008 and have benefited every year from the small business bonus, and they were keen to emphasise the strong support that that has provided for their business. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm the Scottish Government's intention that not only in this Parliament, but in uh, the next Parliament, if the SNP is re-elected, that uh, the Byron Bakery and other small businesses in Aberdeen will continue to benefit from the small business bonus? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's uh, instructive, Presiding Officer, to judge uh, the choices that members make about the visits they make on Small Business Saturday. Uh, there we have Mr Macdonald uh, visiting a bakery, which um, maybe is a surprise to some of us given his, his new svelte figure that he has, but uh, uh, the fact that his first choice was a bakery is very instructive indeed. I, I visited for, my sin, uh, for myself the, uh, the award-winning florist in Blairgowrie, Something Special Flowers, which perhaps says something about my softer side for <laughs> answering parliamentary questions. I can confirm to Mr Macdonald that the Small Business Bonus Scheme represents significant assistance to small companies around the country. Uh, the First Minister confirmed in her uh, address to Parliament in setting out the programme for government on the 26th of November that the government will continue the scheme until the end of the Parliament and, if re-elected in 2016, will continue it for the next parliamentary term as well. Thank you. Question number five, Lewis Macdonald. The energy sector in the North Sea. Fergus Ewing. The generation report highlights that factors such as capital expenditure, decommissioning and international trade will drive the size and shape of the future workforce. Future jobs uh, growth depends on investment in the UKCS. The autumn statement has done little to encourage investment in the UKCS. Thank you, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Minister will be well aware that a thousand jobs have gone already in the last few months and that thousands more are on the line. And given the recent report on fuelling the next generation, does he agree that employers in the sector cannot afford to shed staff today and expect to recruit staff tomorrow? Will he encourage the sector to protect jobs in order to maintain continuity, keep confidence high and provide security for the workforce both on and offshore? Minister. Well, yes, I, I think that's a fair and sensible approach that uh, Lewis MacDonald has highlighted. It's certainly one which I have espoused and sought to deploy in leadership, and I spoke to the Opito uh, business breakfast in November during the National Oil and Gas Skills Week. We provide an extra $6.5 million to establish Energy Skills Scotland. We encourage all companies, small, medium and enormous, to uh, take on young people, and a great many of them do, but I think there is more that can be done, and it's essential during these very challenging times that companies do not cut costs by cutting the number of young people that they employ. So I certainly subscribe to that, that principle. Thank you. Question number six, Ken McIntosh, was not lodged. I therefore call question number seven, David Stewart. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the impact on the economy of abolishing air passenger duty for young people. Minister Ferguson. UK Government assessment certified by the OBR estimates that the Exchequer impact of the policy will cost £40 million in 2014-15 rising to £95 million in 2019-20. However, HMRC analysis concluded that, quotes, the measure is not expected to have any significant economic impacts. We have urged the UK Government to act on the Smith Commission recommendation and devolve APD so that we can reduce the tax to help unlock Scotland's full economic potential, boost international connectivity and tourism, as there is now cross-party agreement on the need to devolve APD to Scotland, it is vital that the UK Government presiding officer takes early action to implement this. And this view, of course, is shared by Scotland's main airports, who have written to each of the Westminster party leaders urging quick progress. Thank you, David Stewart. Uh, presiding officer, does the Minister share my view that the child exemption from APD in 2015 and 2016 will provide a reduction in cost to air passengers with children travelling to Scotland. This is obviously good news for Scottish airports such as Inverness within my own region and of course good news for tourism and as the Minister has hinted at is a taster for the full devolution of APD when the Smith Commission proposals are enacted in full. Minister. Well yes I'm delighted to agree with uh, David Stewart who I know takes an interest in matters of aviation and I'm delighted also that this appears to be a measure upon which there is cross-party agreement. As the Minister for Tourism I would be absolutely thrilled and delighted at the prospect of being able to remove one of the substantial barriers and hurdles to attracting more people to be able to come to enjoy the magnificent hospitality that Scotland has to offer and reducing APD and eliminating it eventually uh, would certainly enable that objective to be better achieved. Gavin Brown. Thank you, President Officer. Um, other than just saying reduce it, what is the Scottish Government's specific policy for day one of devolved APD? Minister. Well, I did actually, if Gavin was listening, he doesn't normally make a mistake of not listening to the answer he just heard. But I did say eventually eliminate it. So I didn't just say reduce it. If, listen, listen up, Gavin. Listen up. But, but, but of course please. we envisage that the 50% reduction, which we said was our policy before the referendum, is our policy after the referendum. We don't shilly-shally and U-turn on our policies like some other parties. Uh, I, I'm sorry that Gavin has despoiled the, the consensus here because I fully hope that we can get cross-party support from almost all members. Uh, to reduce by 50% APD as soon as we possibly can. Thank you. Could we use full names in the chamber, please? Question number eight, Alex Johnston. To ask the Scottish Government what the economic impact on Scotland is of the recent fall in crude oil prices. Minister Ferguson. Uh, Presiding officer, the extent of that impact will depend on how long the low prices last. There are a range of forecasts suggesting that prices will rebound from current levels in 2015. To minimise the predicted economic impact, it is imperative that the UK Government deliver in full their promised new investment allowance and that they do so by no later than the March 2015 budget. Alec Johnston. I thank the Minister for his answer. In fact, five weeks ago I asked the First Minister the same question and he told me that recovery was on the horizon since when oil prices have dropped by a further $25 a barrel. But the Minister will be aware that for the economy of Scotland and particularly the North East, the service industry is vitally important. Is there any action that the Minister can take at this stage to encourage confidence in that industry to prevent any attempt to downsize or relocate to other markets from the North East and ensure that we are in a position to take up where we left off when prices eventually recover? Minister. Well, I, I agree with, with Alec Johnson that it's important to do everything that we can, irrespective of which party we are in, to encourage confidence in the excellent oil and gas industry, which is, uh, in many ways, the best in the world. And they face considerable pressures at the moment because of high costs and low oil prices. Uh, however, the, the predictions that uh, many make is that the oil price will uh, recover uh, and therefore uh, the horizon may not be that far away. Uh, however, I do believe that the most essential element of all, and I say this having had meetings in Aberdeen on Monday 
and also with trade union representatives here yesterday, representing many decades of experience in working in the North Sea. And the essential element is this, until the tax changes promised by George Osborne and Danny Alexander a couple of weeks ago are delivered, there will not be further a new investment in the industry because they do not have the detail. And therefore, that is why it's essential, presiding officer, to conclude that the promised new measures, especially the new investment allowance, is brought forward in the budget in March. Any later than that, uh, and I think there would be extremely serious repercussions. Jackie Bailey. The Deputy First Minister announced in March 2013 the launch of the Oil and Gas Analytical Bulletin. Um, at that stage, they forecast the price of oil um, was to be $113 per barrel. Now it's almost halved at $59 a barrel. Everyone in this chamber, I think, recognises the impact on employment and the economy. But we need reliable figures and analysis, and I'm sure that's something that he agrees with. Does he therefore agree with the critique made by Professor of Economics Ronald MacDonald today um, that, about the importance of oil price estimates? Would the Minister agree that it is time to have an inquiry into the validity of these estimates because we need to have confidence in their predictions? You're currently predicting that it would be more than the OBR predicts and you have always suggested that the OBR is over optimistic. And will he return thereafter to the Chamber with a statement? Minister. Well, in that long and somewhat tortuous question, presiding officer, I was asked to involve in an academic uh, inquiry of some sort. Frankly, I haven't really got time for that. We're too busy working with the oil industry now to help them here and now. That's why we have delivered over 100 additional account management services to 100 SMEs. That's why we've, addition, uh, we've provided over £6 million for energy skills. That's why we, unlike the UK government, have set up a, an innovation fund of £10 million. Uh, that's why we have increased our SDI staff all over the world. And that's why, most serious of all, what the industry reads right now is details of the budget measures that were promised. And from meetings that I've had with operators, from discussions I've had with trade unions and academics in the last few weeks, it is absolutely clear and beyond political debate that what is required for more investment and confidence in the industry is implementation of the vague promises that were delivered in the autumn statement and most especially the investment allowance. And that investment allowance must be put in place by March in the budget. That is the absolute priority for everyone, not having some rerun of the referendum that Jackie Bailey seems to want. Briefly, please, Neil Finlay. Given his prediction was $113 a barrel, um, and now we see the oil price just now, does he agree with me that he may be a Ewing, but he's certainly no JR? <laughs> Minister. I always had a soft spot for JR. Question number nine, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how the piloting of project bank accounts will impact on small businesses in the construction sector. Minister Fergus Ewing. Medium sized businesses based in Scotland form the backbone presiding officer, of our national construction capacity. Project bank accounts should reduce the amount of time it takes for vital cash to reach them and provide confidence for those firms who rely on work from the public sector projects by reducing their exposure to credit and improving their overall cash flow. Uh, position. Project bank account trial projects are ongoing and will be evaluated in due course. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Minister for that answer. Can the Minister confirm whether the Scottish Government will continue with project bank accounts and what benefits does the Government believe their use brings? Minister. Well, yes, we have been continuing to trial project bank accounts uh, and I'm delighted that the Member is taking a close interest in this topic. Uh, of course, the main two benefits that it delivers are that the small business in the, in the contract chain in major works get paid for the work directly and they get paid on time. They don't have to wait for several months whilst money may sit in the account of someone higher up the contract chain. And secondly, as those of us who are uh, my, like myself, slightly longer in the tooth than we would wish, and remember the Lilly debacle, uh, the risk is that small companies who are lower down in the chain uh, may face insolvency as a result of problems higher up the chain. Project bank accounts are designed to tackle both 
of those well-known and identified problems. And I'm delighted that the Scottish Government is piloting them and trying them out. And we will most certainly come back to debate this issue, which the member takes such a close interest in, very soon. Thank you. Question number 10, Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support enterprise and business across the South Scotland parliamentary region. Cabinet Secretary John Sweeney. So the Scottish Government is committed to supporting sustainable economic growth across Scotland. We, work, we recognise the particular challenges faced in the South of Scotland and work closely with a wide range of delivery partners to promote economic activity in the area. By way of example, in 2014, regional selective assistance awards worth over £6.2 million were awarded to 13 businesses across all the local authorities in the South of Scotland parliamentary area, creating 665 jobs and safeguarding 173. Jim Hume. Thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer, but, but it will be of little comfort to the only surviving auction mart on the Scottish borders, which four years ago had a massive hike in its business rates overnight without consultation. This mart is a significant employer and vital to the local rural economy. The mart has a sister mart, similar in footprint, just a few miles across the border near Wooler. That mart has rates of around £11,000, whereas the mart in the borders, the rates are around a staggering £90,000 about nine times more expensive to do business north of the border because of this government's harsh decisions. Will the Deputy First Minister act now to right this wrong so that marts are not working under such an unfair, non-competitive regime in Scotland compared to England? Deputy First Minister. The first thing I have to say to, to Mr Hume is, of course, that the valuation process for the uh, valuation of properties for uh, non-domestic rates is carried out by... Uh, entirely independently of government by the valuation boards around the country. And I know there have been issues about the uh, auction marks issues, and ministers have, uh, have engaged very directly with auction marks on uh, this question in the aftermath of the revaluation. But I stress that these um, judgments are arrived at by the um, independent valuation process. And of course, there is the entitlement and the right for appeals to be undertaken against these valuations that are undertaken. Now, I don't have the information to hand, but from my general knowledge of the, uh, the position of the handling of um, appeals, the overwhelming majority of appeals have now been settled. In fact, um, you know, a very, very significant proportion of appeals have now been settled. I will inquire as to whether the appeal in relation to the auction mark to which Mr Hume refers has been settled, because that is the due process that is there for companies to determine whether or not uh, they have uh, the, the, appropriate, the, the appropriate rateable value issues have been considering, uh, considered in determining that issue. On the wider question about the role of auction marks, I recognise the significance of auction marks in the <coughs> rural economy. Um, they are significant to provide a focal point for um, the trade and activity of the agricultural sector and ministers will be happy to continue our discussions with the auction mark sector which I know has been taken forward by my colleague the Rural Affairs Secretary. Many thanks. Question number 11, Richard Baker. Uh, thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support employment and the economy in the North East in response to Oil and Gas UK's report fuelling the next generation. Thank you. Uh, Fergus Ewing, Minister. Uh, we in the Scottish Government are supporting the industry by a wide variety of measures within the devolved functions. The industry does, however, require more support from Westminster on reserved functions. Richard Baker. In response to the, the Minister's responsibilities, can the Minister tell us how Scottish Enterprise will respond to new challenges in the North East economy, given the fall in the oil price? And given uh, that ongoing skills gaps remain an additional challenge for the sector, which it doesn't need at the moment, uh, as the report uh, identifies, doesn't this highlight the need to invest in skills and not to reduce investment for their education, which unfortunately has been a track record of this government? Minister. Well, I agreed with much until the, the last sub-clause, but uh, in response to his question, what are Scottish Enterprise doing? Well, here is the report which Jenny Maher asked about decommissioning published in October. Uh, I met uh, Scottish Enterprise staff, as I always do, in Aberdeen when I visited uh, on Monday with uh, uh, numerous meetings there. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that the Scottish Enterprise staff have an excellent team uh, which are delivering a wide range of support to the industry and that that is hugely valued and that it has enormously helped, particularly SMEs, achieve their potential, grow enormously and take on very large numbers of staff, often providing 
services and goods which are exported throughout uh, the world. But of course, on the skills front, we have also provided more resources to enable our colleges and our universities, and Aberdeen offers some of the finest in the world, to give young people the skills, the training, the qualifications that they need to play a part in this excellent industry. So I think we do share the same aspiration, uh, if not always the same conclusions in this matter. Gavin Blaine. Uh, when will the next Scottish Government oil and gas analytical bulletin be published? Minister. Well, we will publish appropriate statistical information in due course. Uh, however, publication of statistical information is, yes, important, but it's not as important, presiding officer, as getting the right tax measures for the industry. And I can just tell members that, and I do hope that this will be an approach that's shared across all the parties, the industry faces enormous challenges at the moment. And until such time as the ground rules are established for the basis of new investment, uh, it is not reasonable to expect that billions of dollars will be invested in new fields, new developments and extensions. That is why the most important message, and I think I'm getting it across fairly loud and fairly clear, is that the promised measures by the UK government a couple of weeks ago must be delivered no later than March. That is the imperative, and I do hope that this will be an approach that is shared across all parties. Question number 12, Ian Gray, has been withdrawn and an explanation has been provided. Question 13, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what response it has received to requests from the, to the UK Government to meet and discuss the impact of passport control procedures on the cruise liner sector and tourism in Scotland. Fergus Ewing. The UK Government introduced without consultation face-to-document passport checks on cruise liner passengers. The Scottish Government remains very concerned about the damaging effect this is having on the cruise industry across the UK. The issue of passport checks on cruise liner passengers was first raised with the Scottish Government at the Convention of the Highlands and Islands in October 2012. And since then, despite the fact that the Scottish Government has made five, five separate requests to meet UK ministers to discuss the issue, we have not been successful. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that reply. And the Minister and myself have discussed the matter before, both inside and also outside of the Chamber. And I share the Minister's frustrations that the UK Government do not appear to want to talk about the issue. But does the Minister agree with me, however, that although the Smith Commission proposals do not propose transferring passport control measures to Scotland, it does recognise in paragraph 17 that it may be appropriate to devolve further powers beyond those set out in the Heads of Agreement, and that the transferring of these passport control powers could enable a Scottish solution to an industry that is growing and which is having a positive effect upon the economy of Scotland and also in Inverclyde. Minister. Well, yes, I do, and it's essential that the UK Government does listen to Scotland's needs and that it acts accordingly. Uh, and uh, Stuart McMillan, who, who has really championed this issue in the Scottish Parliament, uh, quite rightly highlights that cruise, uh, the cruise market, cruise lining in Scotland, has risen exponentially in Scotland, presiding officer, as I've seen from places such as Greenock, where it is now a, a very important part of the local economy, sustaining a great deal of jobs. So there's huge potential. But we do believe that, whereas security issues are, of course, important, that the current approach adopted in this regard is gold-plated and over the top. Uh, and we greatly regret that the UK government, despite our reasoned approach in these matters, is not willing properly to engage with the Scottish government to find a better, more practical and successful solution. Thank you. Question number 14, Graham Pearson. Uh, presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government when the independent commission to examine council tax alternatives will begin its work and what timetable it will work to. John Sweeney. Presiding officer, the commission will commence in early 2015 and it will report in the autumn. Graham Pearson. Uh, I'm very grateful for that reply. Mr Swinney will remember that as far back as 1997, the SNP manifesto promised the introduction of local income tax. In 2007, the manifesto promised scrapping the unfair council tax. Uh, and today, we have had the reply from the minister indicating a timescale. Uh, does he appreciate the pressure that COSLA local authorities have faced in those 17 years? 
and will he ensure that the appropriate priority is placed in ensuring that a, a working solution is discovered within that timescale? Deputy First Minister. Well, the, the, the last time I looked, I hadn't been in power for 17 years. Uh, it may feel like that to Mr Pearson, but it's only been seven and a bit. And if COSLA were feeling pressure under the previous ten years before I came into office, then the pressure was delivered by his good colleagues on the Labour Party, uh, both in the United Kingdom Government and the Scottish Government. So, so that, that's the first point. The second point is that on local authority funding, um, local, authority has, local authorities have been... Um, well supported financially by the Scottish Government. Uh, we have had um, years of negotiated and agreed settlements between local government and the Scottish Government since this Government came to office. Uh, local Government's share of the total budget available to the Scottish Government is higher today than when this Government came to office in, 1990, uh, in 2007. So uh, on the, the whole area of local government finance, Local authorities have been better and more securely supported by the Scottish Government. The final point I'd make is on the establishment of the Commission to examine issues around local taxation. The Government wants to proceed on this basis in line with the recommendations given to us by the Local Government and Regeneration Committee in the broadest spirit of agreement we possibly can do. So last week we talked to the COSLA leadership about the steps we can take in partnership with local government to take forward this agreement. The invitation was made in the First Minister's statement to Parliament on the 26th of November on the programme for government that we want to include all political parties in this process and the government wants to try to proceed in with as much agreement as we possibly can do and I hope the Labour Party will be part of that agreement into the bargain. Thank you. Question number 15, Richard Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government what detail the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy can provide on the allocation of the Barnet consequentials arising from the recent increase in UK Government health spending. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, I announced on the 3rd of December that the Barnet consequentials arising from the increase in the UK Government health spending will be passed on in full to the NHS in Scotland. Richard Simpson. Can I thank the... Uh, Cabinet Secretary for that answer, which doesn't really give us any further detail. But the, I wonder if you'd like to comment on the fact of the publication of the recent report from the Scottish Public Health Observatory, SCOTPO. This showed that out of 11 actions which can reduce health inequalities, paying the living wage was by far the most effective. Having failed to make this happen in the Public Procurement Bill, Will the government now follow the lead of London and ensure that all public sector contracts require workers engaged in those contracts to be paid a living wage in order to reduce health inequalities? Deputy First Minister. Let me start with the point upon which I agree with Dr Simpson, that the living wage is um, the, the most effective way to tackle poverty uh, and inequality. So uh, I agree unreservedly with that point. Uh, that is why the government has taken steps to lead from the front by the payment of our own staff and public sector workers covered by our pay policy, the living wage, by um, taking forward uh, mechanisms that are supportable in law, um, which is the issue which um, Dr Simpson has heard all the debates, as I have, about the uh, advice of the European Commission and the advice that we have. Um, so we have taken forward steps uh, within law to negotiate contracts that provide for the payment of the living wage and we've managed to secure that most recently in relation to the government's catering contract and to the cleaning contracts uh, within the government. Um, we also at the National Economic Forum last week um, led a debate on the importance and the imperative of extending the living wage um, and uh, broadly across the private sector and I'm delighted to say that that received a very strong and positive endorsement from many private sector organisations that were in attendance, resulting in some companies changing their practice as a consequence of the National Economic Forum. And that's what the government will continue to take forward in concert with the Poverty Alliance, with whom we work very closely on these questions. Thank you. Question number 16, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy has had with colleagues regarding the allocation in the 2015-16 draft budget for housing adaptations for older and disabled tenants of registered social landlords. John Sweeney. 
President, officer, I can confirm that the £10 million funding available in 2014-15 for registered social landlords to deliver adaptations to help older and disabled people live at home independently and safely will be maintained in 2015-16. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? The Scottish Housing Regulator reports that on average social housing tenants wait 66 days for medical adaptations to be completed with some registered social, social landlords taking a staggering 358 days. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that these time sales are completely unacceptable? And what action will he take to support the Housing Minister to ensure that local authorities have the support to help older and disabled residents which, to, to have medical adaptations implemented as soon as possible? Deputy First Minister. But I agree with Mary Fee that uh, uh, you know, if, if an assessment is made that an individual requires some adaptation in their, their, their own home to support safe and independent living, then they, they should be able to secure that in a credible timescale. And, and the timescales that uh, Mary Fee read out there are, are not credible. So um, I, I will look carefully at this. I'll discuss it with the Minister for Housing. And if there is any particular additional support I can offer to the work that I'm sure she's taken forward, I, I will certainly do so. Thank you. Question number 17, John Mason. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on how the Scottish budget method of consultation and committee deliberation compares with that of the UK. John Swinney. So over the course of the summer, I engaged extensively on our budget priorities with a wide range of stakeholders, including our partners in local government, the trade unions and those from business organisations, the third sector and low carbon interests. Since it was published on the 9th of October, the 2015-16 draft budget has been on the agenda of over 40 different Scottish Parliament committee sessions with at least a dozen ministerial evidence sessions. I have already written to the finance sports people of the main parties in the Scottish Parliament to seek their views on the draft budget and I hope to, maintain, uh, to meet with each of them in the new year to discuss it. Uh, while I am always open to discussion on how the process can be improved, I believe that the comprehensive consultation and scrutiny process that I have just outlined is one that most stakeholders and parliamentarians south of the border uh, would consider to be a very strong proposition. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I, mean, I wonder if he would agree with me that basically Westminster's methods are outdated theatre, they are not fit for a modern democracy, and they make it extremely difficult for the Scottish Parliament to plan ahead. Deputy First Minister. Um, well, the, the, certainly, in, in, in scrutiny terms, the, uh, I, I think the Parliament um, in Scotland has always established, and this dates back to the first legislation, that, um, or one of the very first parts of the legislation we passed in the Public Finance and Accountability Act in 1999-2000, in, 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 in which we recognised the importance of effective financial scrutiny. Uh, I certainly, it certainly feels like that from where I'm sitting, presiding officer, uh, that there is effective scrutiny of the, of the financial commitments the government makes. Uh, but of course, we are always willing to, um, to, to, to take forward any suggestions that are made in that respect. And certainly from my experience uh, as a member of the House of Commons, uh, there is certainly significantly greater scrutiny of financial provisions in this Parliament than there ever was in the House of Commons. Question number 18, Chick Brody. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that it should establish a Scottish Exchequer to accommodate further tax and spending policies going forward. John Sweeney. <coughs> the Scottish Government will continue to build on its reputation for fiscal competence in implementing the limited tax and spending powers recommended for devolution by the Smith Commission. These powers will be exercised within a fiscal framework that provides an equitable settlement for both the Scottish and United Kingdom governments. Chick Brody. Cabinet Secretary, for his answer, with the increased powers proposed by the Smith Commission, and then again with the inevitable increased further powers in revenue and expenditure functions such as all, all welfare benefits and total powers in tax administration collection in borrowing and financial policy, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that a fully-fledged Scottish Exchequer will be necessary to apply macro-financial policies in preparation for the independence that will come? Deputy First Minister. Well. Uh, certainly, uh, for, for, for Scotland to be an independent country, it would require to have all necessary skills and capabilities at its disposal to ensure that all functions were properly and effectively exercised. Uh, I can assure Mr Brodie that as we take forward the additional responsibilities that we have, and we are doing this in relation to um, the land and buildings transaction tax and the landfill tax, we are acquiring the skills and the expertise to ensure that we can properly exercise these functions. That will be the continued approach of the Scottish Government as we acquire further responsibilities. Thank you. That concludes questions. I will now move on to the next item of business. I will allow a few seconds for members to change places.
The next item of business is a statement by Angela Constance on historic child abuse. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement. There should be there for no interruptions or interventions. And I call on uh, Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes. Thank you, President.